the education phase. In this lesson we provide a process overview of the all-important education phase. The education phase is really the engine house of the mediation process and is comprised of four key conversations. A conversation about what happened, a conversation about feelings, a conversation about thoughts and particular assumptions, and a conversation about needs. Then we can move on to the option generation, but first the education phase. According to Susan Carpenter and William Kennedy in their book Managing Public Disputes, the more time the parties invest in educating each other, the greater chance they will have of developing options and reaching agreements. Often the temptation is for the participants to cut to the proverbial chase, to identify the issue and immediately want to find a quick fix to make it go away. As tempting as this is, this is a classic pitfall. The four conversations. One of the most important tasks for us as the mediator is to keep the participants engaged in attending to the four key conversations that are required for a successful education phase. The first is that each is given an uninterrupted period of time to share their perspective of the situation. Obviously within reason. At times you may have to intervene to address the need for ongoing balance as regards airtime. This really is the first conversation. The conversation when they talk about what happened, the facts, or why we are here. At their best they will describe in neutral terms their observations. At worst it will be emotionally charged evaluation of the situation with blind projected judgments of the other. All the while you are keeping notes and allowing information and clues to support the reframing the statements into your awareness. Beyond describing what happened, the participants also need to explore their emotional reactions and feelings about what happened, both the conflict situation that has brought them to the mediation and also how they are feeling during their participation in the mediation itself. The third conversation focuses on what the participants are thinking. This leads us to their assumptions and conclusions that they've made about one another, especially the negative assumptions about one another's motives. And finally, the participants talk about their needs. So these are the four conversations. Their perspective of what happened, how they feel, what they think, and what they need. Rapport. As empathic rapport builders, we constantly seek to build trust and confidence in ourselves and the process. This is ongoing, but is especially important during the education phase when the participants start to engage and actively participate in the process. In the education phase, we want to demonstrate to the participants that we have understood their perspective. We do this primarily by summarizing what we have heard each of them share. We do this for both. We are balanced and omnipartial, equally there for everyone. It is through our even-handedness, especially as we summarize and repeat back what we have heard, that we establish that perception that we are not taking sides, that we are omnipartial and balanced. Who goes first? As already stated, each participant has a turn to share. One of the issues we need to address is who goes first. We explored this in the lesson on the opening statement. In general, we start with the person who has initiated proceedings or who has less social power. However, as noted during that lesson, there will be times when we deviate from that simple rule. For example, when the person who would go second wants to make an apology. Of course, there are also times when it makes sense for one person rather than the other to go first, and when that applies, we should follow that logic, clearing the table. The reality is that the person going first sets the stage. It can be very difficult for the second person to follow without feeling like they have to respond or rebut what they have just heard. A good practice is to clear the table or clean the slate after the first person is gone, so that the second person has a clear table or a clean slate from which to start. The second person should be invited to share their perspective as if they were going first. Each has a turn to share. They may have more than one turn. Structure the process of sharing so that it is not frustrating to the participants and that there is balance. And eventually, momentum will emerge, which will allow a much more natural conversation to take place. Interruptions. 
As the participants start talking to one another directly, talking about their situation, what happened, how they felt, what they're thinking and what they're needing, it is inevitable that one or the other of them is going to interrupt. Don't be surprised. Be prepared. Now is a good time to think about how you will handle interruptions. The dilemma of ignoring the first interruption is that when the second one comes and it's made by the other person, if you haven't addressed the first, it's going to lead them to wonder why you didn't say something when the first person interrupted. It is for that reason that I tend to make a note of the first interruption. To say something, even if it's just to say, one at a time, remember? Something simple and gentle to remind them, like a gesture with your hand. As the conversation continues and interruptions continue to occur, you will need to increase the severity of your interventions. This is why having ground rules is so important. You can refer back to them and you can say, guys, remember we said no interruptions. Are we still following this ground rule? Or do we need to have a conversation about them and change them? Another good idea that helps with interruptions is to make writing pads available for both participants. You can encourage them to write down their ideas on the writing pad. Tell them something like, we often interrupt because we're afraid that we'll forget what we're going to say. Having a writing pad helps in this regard. Make sure you write down all the points you want to make, so when it's your turn, you can do so effectively. Fragmentation Sometimes during the education phase, it becomes apparent that breaking up the large, unmanageable, unruly conflict into smaller, bite-sized pieces is a good idea. In conflict management, we call these smaller pieces issues. The benefit of breaking a conflict down into smaller pieces, chunking or fragmenting it, is that it enables us to develop an agenda. Often an agenda is a very useful tool to structure the rest of the mediation, but like so many of the tools and ideas that I've shared with you, it is not an absolute necessity. It's something that you may choose to do, but don't have to do all of the time. This ends our general overview of the education phase, while highlighting key process issues that require sensitivity. In the following lessons, we focus on each of the four conversations that are foundational to the education phase. Perspectives, feelings, thoughts and needs. Things are getting more and more interesting. As always, your attention is greatly appreciated.